Last week, Saturday, was my birthday, and as tradition, I go for a really long bike ride, listen to music, just enjoy the countryside. And I left Bodmin Parkway Railway Station, extremely hungover, had to get up to Tintagel, and it's it's over Bodmin Moor, it's all very hilly and everything. I took no supplies at all. It was a really hot day. I took no water or food. But halfway along in the journey, I was just like, oh, I was pretty much ready to collapse. I was pretty exhausted, and um, I didn't know if I was going to make it all the way. I um, decided for some reason to listen to our podcast, because I hadn't listened to it properly, and I thought this was a good time to listen to it. And uh, I was really struggling to get through my journey. It was like you were spirits egging me on, keeping me going. <laughs> I was just like really trying to get through this journey. But listening to you guys chatting about music and like everything, it was almost like having you there by my side going, come on, mine, you can do it. You can get there. And I, I did get there in the end. But... There we go. The Cacophony Sessions, helping middle-aged men since 2020. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the second episode of the Cacophony Sessions podcast. If you're just joining us, uh, I've got four guests this evening for a discussion about our favourite thing in the world, which is music. Um, if you're just starting to listen to us now, go back and listen to the first one. It does give you a good idea of what we're all about. I'm your host, Dan. This week, we'll be going head-to-head as we try and find songs that everybody loves by submitting them before the panel this evening, which consists of Pete, Tom, Dave, Martin and myself. So the same people from the first episode. It's been a few weeks since the last episode. We're starting to see a return to normal lives now. Um, Since the last episode, I haven't really discovered much new music, but I've been looking back at a lot of old stuff, especially stuff from 2003, 1991, after they were um, covered last last week. I've been listening to a lot of Tribe Called Quest, a bit of Nirvana as well. Um, And from 2003, I went back and listened to The Love Below and Speaker Box. Um, Electric Six of all things, which I don't think we even mentioned in 2003, so there's an extra point for you from last week, Tom, there. Um, what's everyone else been doing? I recently discovered that one of my favourite bands from years ago have been doing a new project, and they've been doing a podcast as well. It's a band called 65 Days of Static, and for the last 12 months they've released an EP of ambient electronic music every month. Um, so that's a hell of a lot of music that I've ploughed my way through. But it also gave me a good excuse to go back to their old albums and realise how much I loved them. And then just before we started, I was saying to Martin how it's really interesting listening to the back catalogue of that band. They've been going for 16 years, well, longer than that, 19 years now. And it's interesting to hear how they start off as a little bit electronic, but quite in the post-rock vein, and then go down sort of the electronic rabbit hole and then thinking about how loads of the other bands that that go on for a long time all end up being stadium rock bands or electronic acts. I was just thinking how it seems like when bands get, when they've said what they want to say on their first couple of albums, I think they always end up going electronic or stadium rock because electronic is, I guess, if you've got a load of time in the studio, you can tinker with all the electronic stuff and you've got time to cultivate something and you're not so worried about writing a song to sell records. And then on the other hand, you've got stadium rocks. Like I know you mentioned Muse before we came on air and they go down that rabbit hole. And I think that's because they're writing songs to perform in the venues that they're then playing in. The problem for me is that as soon as they turn into a stadium rock band, I'm not interested anymore. Why is that? (laughs) Yeah, Why is that? Why is that? Um, it's because you listen to like the best example of this I can think of is Biffy Clyro. Like I love, I love that band's first three albums so much. And then the problem is that when bands start going down the stadium rock route, they tend to fall back on the blues scale and the Mixolydian scale because it translates well in a great big concert hall. And as soon as that happens, I'm interested, in, I'm instantly not interested in it anymore. <laughs> I kind of like see a similar thing with the Foo Fighters where the first album was great, alternative rock by numbers really, and that's what they are. But as they've got progressively on and become more stadium, their songs are crowd pleasers. You know, they're more like 
Yeah, twenty-seven-year-old <laughs> housewives dropping kids off at school, singing along to times like these. <laughs> to bring back, back reference back, but yeah, um, yeah, I totally get it. it I, I feel the same way sometimes. It's like the time is like almost selling out, isn't it? But it's just I think maybe there's an aspect where when a band gets that successful, and they're I, I call it the Richard Ashcroft effect, where the first two yeah. Verve albums are absolutely stunning. That's because Richard Ashcroft was just a working class northern lad trying to make it. And uh, at one point he was homeless and traveling the country, bumping trains and stuff. As soon as he got successful with Urban Hymns, he had nothing to complain about anymore. He had nothing, no angst, nothing to really feel any like passion for. So the music became really bland. On the other side of the coin, you've got someone like Eddie Vedder, for instance, who had a very difficult upbringing, came from poverty, um, really struggled. Um, now is like one of the most respected musicians on earth, but still has that passion. So I think it's possible that even when you find that level of success, you can still find something to be passionate about. Yeah, I mean, there are two bands that have gone down that stadium rock route that I can pick out straight away that actually did it for quite well, and that's R.E.M. and Simple Minds. Oh, brilliant examples, yeah. Yeah, they both went down the stadium rock route. And then on the other hand, you've got the electronic route with bands like, or the, the more experimental in the studio stuff like Radiohead, you know, they, they're still making good stuff. Um, yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's just quite interesting hearing how bands sounds change over time yet most of the bands that we love maintain part of the sound the whole way through i mean arcade fire they started pretty stadium rock and then went even more so i think but they still always sound like arcade fire you know i quite like that yeah on that on that kind of theory i've been listening to the 1975 a bit recently um yeah. they've got an album out as a uh, a large double album it's very experimental so maybe they're going down that route yeah. but i've got a feeling that the 1975s kind of uh their sound is going to be more suited to going down a stadium route i think yeah yeah oh, that's their best option but it looks like they're going the other way so that's interesting mm. you know what? i've not even heard them i've never i've not heard one song by them no, very good. you yeah. think i would like them Tom, uh, can I ask you, how long do you think this has been going on? I'm just, I mean, I'm just spitballing because I'm really hungover and I needed something to talk about. <laughs> but um, it's, I think it's been going a long time. Like you go back to the Beatles with like in the, in the late 60s, uh, going down the experimental route and holding up in the studio and doing interesting things with tape loops uh, and, and moving away from, I mean, they still had songs, but they weren't necessarily aiming for the immediacy that they were aiming for on their early records um so and not bothering about the whole playing it live thing anymore so i think it's been going on for a long time i think in classical music it often it it often goes the other way so steve reich is one of my favorite composers i've been playing a lot of his stuff lately and he starts off doing really crazy experimental stuff in the 60s but then his later works I hate to say it, all become Steve Reich by numbers, and he just keeps writing very similar things. Although, Martin, you need to check out Radio Rewrite by Steve Reich. He, um, he basically does a classical music remix of uh, Jigsaw Falling Into Place. It's great. I'll, listen, I'll give it a listen. <laughs> Add it to your list. <laughs> it's, I've got a very, very long list. I know. <laughs> Dave, what have you been up to? Um, this week I was kind of catching up like you guys with the stuff that was chatted about last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was checking out, I was making a couple of playlists on Spotify. One was like Southern Rap. So I've watched a television program called Atlanta. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Oh, Donald yeah. Glover. No, um, Ch- um, what's the Donald Glover channel? It's going yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's got loads of kind of old school Southern Rap, which I hadn't heard in ages, like Project Pat and... Coon Daddy, and just stuff I hadn't heard for, like, Master P, stuff from the 90s. Apart from that, just sort of delving around. My selection that I'm going to be going into in a minute will go into one of my other uh, playlists that I was doing, but I won't get into that now. Nothing yet. We'll, we'll save that for a minute, because everybody doesn't know the songs that we've picked. We're going in completely cold here, blind, with the exception of myself. Nobody else knows what everyone else's picks are, so it's going to be uh, interesting, to say the least. Uh, Pete, what have you been up to? Uh, still making music, still um, 
working on an album again kind of eternally but uh, hopefully managing to get somewhere this time around um, so I've not been listening to any specific artists really I've been um, just I've been listening to quite a lot of like modern pop listening to uh, things with that kind of that really sort of sub bass kind of sound in it um, so I've been playing around quite a lot with uh, quite a lot with that really sort of stuff that's a bit more uh, a bit more modern any one artist you want to pick up on um, well I've been listening to quite a lot of Drake his stuff is sort of at the forefront of all of that and I um, yeah other artists sort of around that I listened to um, what was I listening to I was listening to a, a track by um, a guy called, um, which isn't really modern pop, I suppose, but it's a guy called Young Stupid, who's, it's like, really like modern West Coast gangster rap, um, okay. with a kind of a bit of a poppy kind of feel to it. So, so just things like that, really, things that have got that, that modern kind of sound to it. I've just been trying to catch up a little bit, as I feel I've been, you know, in the dark ages a little bit with, uh, with music, so trying to listen to, to stuff that's a lot more recent, I suppose. Cool. Martin, what have, you, have you been listening to anything in particular? Yeah, kind of. Um, as you all know, I had all of my music stuff stolen last year. So my entire collection of music that I've been putting together for well, most of my life, really, and all of my own projects and my software and my hardware all went, recovered it um, this last week. Um, and so I've kind of like been, um, as I've been going through what I had, I've completely forgotten how much music I'd actually amassed. Um, and uh, today I opened up all the Nine Inch Nails stuff I had. I know it's a bit boring for me to say, oh, I was banging about bloody Nine Inch Nails, but um, there's some stuff in there I'd f forgotten I'd had, like really rare, like tour rehears rehearsal recordings and things like that. But also um, I'm on an ongoing mission to um, get as much of my favourite music on vinyl. And uh, I, on my birthday, I treated myself to Dandy Warhol's Come Down album on vinyl, so I've been rinsing that a bit. And nice. I kind of fell out of love with the Dandy Warhols because after about, kind of after their third album, really, they kind of went really, really downhill really rapidly. And so I t t the magic had gone. Um, you know, there used to be this really cool band that had this really cool sound, the whole 60s revival thing going on, great lyrics and stuff, to just being like, trying too hard to be experimental or trying too hard to be this mm. kind of electronic crossover act. But I put on Come Down and absolutely loved every note of it. I was forgot how great that album is. It's just a beautiful piece of new psychedelia and re retro 60s garage rock. So, yeah, that's what I've kind of been rinsing the most. So, so Martin, what do you think of, like... So, my favourite Dandy Warhol's album is probably the 13 Tales from Urban Bohemia. Yeah, how does, how does that rank for you? That's number one, man. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the kind of the one that got me into them. Well, there's a track on Come Down called Boys Better, which I was at a gig once. I was playing in a band, and we were a support band. And the headlining band were rehearsing, doing a sound check, and they started playing Boys Better. And I was like, whoa, that is cool. What is that? And our drummer was like, oh, it's Dandy Warhols. And that was around the time that song had come out. So that kind of like, I, then I kind of forgot, forgot about them. And then 13 Tales came out and obviously Bohemian Like You, I saw that before it got mm. big. Um, I saw it on like some obscure late night music thing. And uh, yeah, I was like, well, I need to get into this band. Um, obviously it was a similar time I was getting into that whole American new wave of psychedelia. Um, Brian Jonestown Massacre were a big part of that. So yeah, it was like discovering this whole new world. Um, so yeah, Burning Tales is definitely their best album, best songs, best sound. I'm trying to find it on vinyl, but that's impossible at the moment. But yeah, definitely a great album. I'll keep an eye out for you, Mark. Thanks, man. <laughs> so we thought long and hard about what we were going to discuss on the second episode. I think the first episode we wanted to go for a broader overview of our tastes and give the listeners an idea of what everybody's into, what what's going to trigger certain people in conversation. So we thought we'd get a bit deeper on episode two and almost bring a competitive element to it. So what we are going to do is we are going to nominate one song that we think everybody loves. And the way in which we're going to find out if it is a song that everybody loves is see if the other panel members agree. So nobody knows what these songs are. Uh, we're going to go through, we're going to discuss our thought processes on the decisions, we'll give some honourable mentions and just have a discussion around songs, which I'm uh, tentatively titling uh, Undeniable Bangers. So yeah, if I pass over to Pete, I believe you've got uh, a song for us. 
Tell us a bit about your choice, how you made it. Definitely. So uh, this was so just to tell you my kind of thought process with this a little bit uh, quickly. So I kind of decided straight away that if you go for any of the real, real sort of top notch classic songs that you'd say sort of things, um, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder songs or Ain't No Sunshine, that kind of thing. I think there's uh, there's always a risk that someone has heard it too many times mm. and that you potentially you can you can really go off songs if you if it certain songs if it if you hear it too many times so so i kind of i, I ended up going in a really odd direction where i just kind of picked r random songs that i just kind of thought well yeah that seems like the kind of thing that everyone would really like which i suppose was the point but um so there were a few tunes that i that i didn't actually choose but i really massively considered so um i bizarrely i started with suede uh, beautiful ones. Oh, that's a banger! <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the first CD I ever bought. Really? First, that's the first CD I bought vinyl and cassette before. First CD I ever bought was that one. And coming up, isn't it, Neil? Yeah, coming up. Yeah. It's yeah. a great, great album. So that was yeah, that, that was where I started with this. I then I uh, then kind of went to I thought Placebo, who um, I I only really know sort of the popular placebo songs but i thought it's so nancy boy every you every me and pure morning are three that i thought that would, would be things that people would kind of universally like um i thought a massive attack but i couldn't really focus on a song that i thought that people would really like even though i thought it was a band that people would really generally be into oh, yeah, I yeah i'm finished yeah unfinished sympathy is, a, is you know is, is a great shout um I, just to touch on rap quickly the only one that i could think of that maybe universally liked was can i kick it by a tribe called quest um, yeah, I considered that one. Which I thought was really, really up there. Um, and then just a couple of other Smashing Pumpkins, Bullet with Butterfly Wings. Yes. <laughs> which is a great, great song. Uh, the Smiths, the two that I could come up with that I thought would be the most university night would be How, How Soon Is Now and This Charming Man. Mm. And then we have another random one that is kind of just poppy rap, Skilo, I wish. That's a good song. I like that song. I nearly chose that. Yeah. Yeah, I so nearly chose that. It's, it's a really good, it's a really good shout. And then, uh, so those are just things I went to. There were two then that I really that I that I practically picked. You could have shifted these out almost for the one that I did pick. And those were um, the new radicals. Um, you get what you give. And Brown Van Three Thousand drinking in LA. Yeah, both good, both good tunes. Um, that I thought had had that universal appeal. Uh, appeal. And um, but ultimately, I decided on uh, Pearl Jam Even Flow. Oh, good man, Pete. <laughs> yeah, nice choice. Yeah, I mean, I'm disappointed you didn't go for the placebo or the Smashing Pumpkins because that's that's my taste, but mine isn't because Pearl Jam's his thing. <laughs> yeah. It is a great track though. It's good. It's about homelessness, by the way. Yeah, so that was uh, yeah, that was so that was the kind of thought process into to even flow really, um, which isn't a song that I've actually. That I, would, I mean, I knew who Pearl Jam were, but I was never particularly familiar with familiar with them up until about uh, probably about f six or seven years ago. Um, which is actually, I just kept hearing uh, Even Flow on the jukebox actually, and uh, that was and just one of those occasions where you sort of you walk past the jukebox and you just take a sneaky look at it to see what's uh, what's been playing. So yeah, so that was... my go-to Pearl Jam track. I really like. Well, it's not my go-to track, probably because I'm such. I'm such a Pearl Jam obsessive, I've probably listened to it too much. But what I will say is I've seen it played live twice and there is no greater moment than when the crowd are singing every word, word perfect, and just getting it right. And the band are loving it and the crowd are loving it. It's a proper moment of unity song, that one. It is a fantastic. It's a classic riff. It's just 70s classic rock through and through, man. This is perfect in every way. I probably, I probably haven't listened to it for about a year. Mm. I'm probably going to put on ten after we finish <laughs> talking about it. I haven't really listened to it. Probably. Well, it would be good if 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 there's someone you know whose favourite artist ever did a cover of that. I, I believe, I believe in 2013, Prince did do a live version of Even Flow. Uh, yeah, instrumental, yeah. but I am um, very different. But, but, yeah. I, 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 but credit where it's due, I'm not going to say that that's the reason why I love that song. Um, I think that Pearl Jam song captures something special because it's it's very heavy, but it's it doesn't feel inaccessible. Uh, I think there's a, a, a core audience that can really connect with that song because it's 
it, it's quite melodic and the, the, the vocals can be, yeah, they're not the typical um, shouty, grungy, angry vocals. It's quite melodic and it's, it's a really beautiful song. Very oh, melodic. Absolutely, yeah. Also, I want to speak a little bit about the drumming. Pearl Jam's first three albums mainly is a lot of the grunge that was out at the time. It's very uh, metal, hard rock influenced. Whereas the drummer from drummers, there have been many um, from Pearl Jam, the drum beats were very funky. There was a lot of real funk drumming in their first three albums. You have to listen to it. Um, you kind of because it's because it is grunge and because it is like you know it's hard rock. People kind of don't really focus so much on the individual aspects because it all gels so well. But when you really break it down, the drumming in those tracks, the way they're put together, funky as hell. It really yeah. are, which gives the music a propulsion. Whereas if you had your normal kind of <coughs> eight man four four beats, it would sound sludgy and it would sound kind of generic grunge. I think the drumming particularly really pulls it out. And like you say, Dan, the vocals they're extremely melodic. Eddie Vedder is a master at melody writing. Yeah, it's it's, it's a phenomenal song. Um, and perhaps that's why Prince was able to cover it, because there is that. You know, could cover anything, to be honest, Dan, couldn't he? Let's face it. This is episode two, and I don't want to talk about Prince all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to. No. One, <laughs> thing, one, yeah. thing, one thing I did think about picking that song, though, is, uh, Dave, I remember last uh, podcast you said that you, I believe you moved into a place and it was the only CD that you had. So I did wonder whether you'd uh, maybe heard it a few too many times. Uh, yeah, I mean, I absolutely rinsed that CD. So that was, I mentioned last week, that when I, one of my first jobs was like a disabled carer and I got given a flat as part of the um, pay. But in that flat, yeah, I had 10 already in the CD player. Whoever had it before me had left it there, thank God, because I hadn't brought anybody with me and I had no money whatsoever. So... Yeah, I probably rinsed it, but I would have been about 17 or 18 then. So when the rear view, like remaster album came out a few years back, I listened to it again then, and it, I decided that was probably my favourite track from 10. Mm. Okay. Strong praise. Strong yeah. praise. So it sounds as though we may, on our first attempt, have found one that meets the criteria. So I'm going to quickly ask everybody uh, so we can be clear. Um Tom, would you say even flow banger, yes or no? Yeah, go on then. Martin? It's really bad song, man. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a lie. We do. <laughs> yeah. Dave? Yes, 100%. And from myself, it's very much a yes. Hey. So, Pete, take a seat on our winner's bench because uh, we have found that even flow is an undeniable banger. Yes. Let's go. Let's go to someone else, and they can. Uh, they can. We can have our second song of the evening. I, I'm going to go to Tom. The reason why I've gone for this track is I tried to think about what sort of music everybody on the panel is into. So I know, for example, Martin and I share a lot of taste in music. Uh, I know Dave has a background in electronic music. Um, Pete hip-hop and electronic-y stuff. So I tried to go for something that sort of covered all of that because my taste in music, it turned, the, more I, the more I look into it, it's not that mainstream. So I started thinking about tracks that I could choose and it was like Minerva by Deftones. And I know Martin will go for that one, but nobody else will. <laughs> so... Oh. Or Rebellion Lies by Arcade Fire was another one that was on my, was on, on my list. But um, in the end... I'm a huge Smashing Pumpkins fan, so anything off Melancholy and I would have been happy. But in the end, I decided to a track that... So I remember this track because when I was at university, the thing in Exeter, the thing you used to do on a Friday night was go to... They had this sort of indie club night at a nightclub called Timepiece. And this track was on every week without fail and... It's one of the few songs in the world I can actually dance to when I'm drunk. Um, and it's uh, Blue Monday by New Order. Oh, wow. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> That's a good one. Absolutely brilliant. Which version, though? It's probably about 15, isn't it? There? Yeah, there's, there's three major ones, because there's the original 1983 12-inch, which is the best-selling 12-inch single of all time, yeah. that they lost 5p on for every yeah. copy sold. Um, and then they re-released, they did the 1998 version, and then there's another one from 1995. Um, the one that they used to play, there's 
two versions of these well there's also hundreds of remixes because i'm pretty sure too many djs used to put it in one of their dj sets quite a lot so it's often but um i think see the thing i love about the original version is the re for example the reason the keyboards and the drum part at the beginning are slightly out of sync is because the keyboard player forgot to put one of the notes into the sequencer and i love that about the original oh, version it's okay. i always wondered that because it is a very strange yeah. intro yeah, it's it's got that sort of although they're doing something that's very electronic, that little thing there is just like a little lo fi thing in amongst it, which I quite like. Um, didn't they play it on um like the top of the pops or something like that where they yeah. all played the wrong instruments? So yeah, they in, they insisted on playing it live and none of their synthesizers worked. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a great song. I, I love that song. It's, I think I saw that version the, when you were talking about Dan. I think got that through Cooked and Bombed. Yes, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a link on there. And yeah, it's, you can see Bernard Sumner getting really angry as they're playing it. It's just yeah. it's an important single. I think. I think it definitely started the the end of Joy Division era kind of new yeah. order into what they would do later in the nineties and stuff like Technique and things like that, where they. Um, they would go down the more electronica route, as opposed to the stadium route. <laughs> yeah, I would say I like I like that song. Yeah, it's an absolute terror. I very nearly choose something of substance or power, corruption, and lies myself. Um, but it's a band I love to death, um, and that track. I actually had it on 12 inch until very recently, the original 5p loss version that you're talking about. But um, I sold it for quite a lot of money recently because I had the app on the album. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's an absolutely cracking single. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned um, Substance because Substance is one of, in, in my opinion, one of the greatest compilation albums of all time. Um, and it came out in 1987, and I didn't even didn't even mention it. Whoa, what an oversight! You're banned from the podcast, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Blue Monday is that it's one of those tracks that transcends genre in its fans. Um, I mean, something like Even Flow, for instance, if we're sticking to the songs we're talking about, is, as we know, it's a banger, but people who don't really like rock music are probably not really going to be that into it. But Blue Monday, it's kind of, if you like quality music or especially alternative music, then uh, no matter what style of alternative music you're into, you will like that song. It's just got that overall... I've heard so many people say the same thing, Martin. Yeah. I hate it music you play them that they're like oh wait, I, I don't hate that <laughs> actually i really love synthesizers and i'm gonna throw away my guitar and get a get a moog <laughs> you know what I mean? maybe maybe a large part of that is due to the fact that it is whilst it is an electronic track and they use a lot of synthesizer on it a large part of the track is what peter hook's doing on the bass so it's it's not necessarily a completely electronic track they're a band that are making that, and so that kind of organicness comes out in it, and maybe that's why it translates so well to people that aren't necessarily into electronic music so much, because there are real elements to the song. I say real in uh, in uh, inverted commas, um, but yeah, it, it's got real bass. It's it's got guitar. It's written as a, it's written by a band who had previously written things like Love Will Tear Us Apart. So it's got a a. A legacy there that is enough to maybe be seen in a different light as something maybe like the prodigy who came later, who's that's purely sample based. based. I love the uh, scene in 24 hour party people when the producer's given uh, him absolute hell for just being a bit of a poser on the bass guitar and telling him to play it. And the line he says is, You wear the bass guitar well. <laughs> yeah, it's Peter Hook. Peter Hook tells a story um, on a documentary about. Um, so he goes to the doctor, and he's he'll t uh, he was having having back trouble, and the doctor says to him, um, like, so what do you do for a living? And he says, oh, I play bass guitar in a band. And so the doctor's looking at him, going, like, why on earth have you got back problems? And then. That then he points out to the doctor that he plays bass guitar around his knees, and then that's that's the whole that's, that's why he's got back trouble. Um, but he's as a bass player, like I find his style very influential, even if he's not technically playing the most complicated stuff. I think his fingerprints are a lot of bass players in the modern era. Are, 
have taken inspiration from him. Manny, for a, for a start. I think Manny from Stone Roses takes a lot from Peter Hook. Just that whole, like... Most of the madness has seen. Yeah. Yeah, but then, yeah, yeah. You can hear echoes of it in, like... I, I'm going to get flack for saying this, but you can hear echoes of like what Peter Hook's doing and what uh, Justin Chancellor from Tool does. Yeah, true. But I'll tell you something. It's, well, with with Peter Hook's bass playing, is no one sounds like him. I mean, that whole high on the neck with the flanging, no, yeah. one's, no one's actually really doing that. They're taking elements of what he does as an inspiration, as an influence. And a lot of the bass players that are influenced by him are technically way better but it's just that raw primal he plays it like a guitar almost and it's it's the flanging on it as well you don't hear that on bass very often with Peter Huck I um I remember do you remember the song um what do you want from me by Monaco oh yeah I remember that yeah um that sounds I remember that coming on the radio um I was very young at the time and I remember thinking that sounds like New Order, and the only song I knew by New Order at the time was True, Th- True Faith, which was popular when I was a kid. Um, and yeah, the, the thing about Monaco is that is Peter Hook, and I, it was not until recently that I discovered that it's from Peter Hook. So I was a he's so distinct in his bass playing that even as a kid, I was able to tell that a side project was from the same band that did something else he was involved in because he's that distinct. Mm-hmm. And that's a really good mark of a true, a, a truly great musician is if you can hear them in a completely different context and you know it's them. They, mm-hmm. He was in another side project with Perry Farrell from Jane's Addiction called Satellite Party. And again, yeah. it was like, and, and Perry Farrell's a big electronic fan, loves his new order. And yeah, it just sounded like Perry Farrell fronting new order, which is no <laughs> bad thing. <laughs> pretty cool, but there we go. Mm-hmm. Pete's been quite quiet during this uh this round though, uh, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm no, not... I have I have some pretty devastating news here, I'm afraid, which is I could I couldn't tell you what song that is. I uh, like I'm not I don't I've I've never really come across a huge amount of Joy Division and uh, a New Order in the sense that I've never really been around people who were, who listen to them massively. Um, so I it, like, undoubtedly I've heard it if it was around so much in the the nineties, but I I couldn't actually differentiate that that or, or pick that tune out if it was playing. Well, I know what song Pete's going to have to listen to is when this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I expect I I expect an apology next week. <laughs> it's noted down along with Minerva, mm. which I'll be interested to check out. Mm. So. Yeah, so I am very, very sorry, but uh, I, I cannot sorry. approve yeah. of being a banger. And Martin's backing me up, and it's That's not... <laughs> uh, such are the rules of the podcast that if somebody on the panel doesn't know it enough to love it, unfortunately, it must be put into the bin with all the rest of the songs, Tom. So that that song can, cannot be certified as an undeniable banger. Uh, we will have to move on. I think Martin's more disappointed than me. <laughs> I'm really, really, really gutted about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, I thought I was only going to upset one panel member, but it's two. <laughs> it's like choosing a child to, like, survive in the weird... <laughs> Rosemary's bait, not Rosemary's, but you know, Sophie's choice, not Rosemary's bait. Sophie's choice, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, this. Who would have thought anyone would equate Blue Monday with Sophie's choice? Uh, Dave, if you could talk us through a bit about your thought process and give us your uh, your nomination. Yeah, no problem. So, like I said, I was looking also at New Order um, and some other 80s electronic acts that I like. The Cure I was looking at for a bit. Um, and the Smiths, like somebody else. But I decided to choose, because I've been delving around and trying to make a sort of playlist or collection of records for a yacht rock night that I want to do recently, I thought I'd go back to Michael McDonald's uh, earlier project, the Doobie Brothers, and choose Taking It to the Streets. Now, this is 
a gamble because not everybody may know this track. Um, and it means that it's going to be thrown out. But an absolute certified terror. Um, I was hoping Pete might know Michael McDonald because obviously he was the famous person that was sampled in Warren G's Regulate. Um, yeah, I know that song, but I'm afraid. Oh, thrown out already. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know, I know the Michael McDonald song that Dave was alluding to there. To Pete and I almost chose that myself, which is the I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. Yeah. That's such yeah. an amazing to you. I almost chose it. But I don't know the song that you chose, Dave. I'm really uh, sorry. Sorry. So Doobie Brothers, obviously, people must know. Yeah, I know Doobie Brothers. Yeah. They were uh, a sort of touring hippie slash just revolving door of musicians throughout the mid 70s all the way through to the late 80s. But um they were known as hard partiers and they dropped like flies. A lot of them went out for drugs or just expiring. One of the like legendary 70s bands when drummers are just imploding or for random reasons and musicians are falling out with each other and getting them. But Michael McDonald joined them in 1975. Um, and then he was just known as a very influential keyboard player and great vocalist and great songwriter. And helped a lot of other sort of what's now come under the genre of yacht rock um helped a lot of other artists come up and worked with a lot of people so they worked with all the notes worked with kenny Loggins, um thousands and thousands of others to list them all would just go on and on and on and on but there was a period in u.s music in like the late 70s early 80s where everything in the top 10 seemed to have him in, in, in some way or another um, but Taking It to the Streets is the title single that he wrote for the Doobie Brothers when he joined them. Um, they were looking for a track for the radio and he provided it pretty well. It's kind of a, sort of a mismatch between gospel, funk and rock. Um, and the chorus is very sort of gospel based. Um, yeah, it's just it's a really good track. If you, you don't listen to it, you have to obviously check it out. And it was a massive gamble, but it was a track that I felt that in the yacht rock genre, people would probably know that haven't already listened to them to death because it's one of the genres you kind of have to circumnavigate the tracks which are just played to death and look at the sort of more obscure. It's a genre, I think, if you just played a set of it DJing every single track, people probably wouldn't be able to tell you the name of the track and the artist, but they're going to know it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, obviously I'd had uh, your choice before we, we came on air tonight. Um, I do know the song, um, it's one of those Doobie Brothers songs that I will, because I've got about three or four albums of theirs and their greatest hits, um, the, Michael McDonald is a big favourite of mine, I absolutely love the, uh, the kind of, um, the timbre of his voice, it's insane, um, so I'll always love anything that he puts his voice to, I mean even something like Ride Like the Wind by uh, Christopher Cross, Christopher Cross, so Man. good. He sings one line, uh, such a long way to go, uh, as the backing vocal, but the whole, but the backing vocal makes the song. That's how good Michael McDonald is. Um, I wouldn't have gone for Taking It To The Streets as, uh, as my favourite uh, Doobie Brothers song. I would have gone with something like uh, What A Fool Believes or Long Train Running. Um, but I think even they may be a little bit too niche. But well, the other, the other track I was hardest celebrating from them was uh, Listen To The Music which as people know, I think it was probably on one of the Marvel soundtracks on a, a hope to kind of lure some other people in. But, I mean, the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack that was called, like, Awesome Mix Volume 1 or something, it's basically got Yacht Rock back-to-backs on there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an odd genre and it's an odd song. It was a risk, but I was hoping I was going to be able to split it under the radar, but no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I respect your choice, actually, um, because yacht rock is a genre that I've heard the word going around for quite a while. I have no idea what it is. So that may be, um, I, I don't know what you think. It might be. It's a, it's a cheesy sort of derogatory title, which alludes to it was rock listening by white yuppies. From America that owns yachts. So Phil Collins, Toto, um, sort of dad rock sort of thing. But within that genre, it's got some absolutely insane musicians and some great songwriting that's really funky bass and drums from most of it. So 
So would you say uh, Patrick Bateman would have been a big fan of Yacht Rock? Big time. Big time. Absolutely, yeah. I kind of get where you're coming from. Uh, is what you would have necessarily called like um, soft rock or um, blue-eyed soul. Um, a lot of things like um, uh, Hall & Oates could be classed as a bit of yacht, yacht rock. Um, especially things like Sarah Smile, which is an absolute all-time tune. Um, that's that's what yacht rock is. I have a bit of a problem with the the use of the word yacht rock because it, you're right, Dave. It is a derogatory term, and it's 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 meant to almost belittle the music. I think the music's better than that. There's some fantastic soft rock songs. I was listening to um, Bread, uh, Make It With You. That's an that's an almighty song um, that, that ended up being covered by Aretha Franklin um, on her Live at Fillmore West album. As we touched upon last time, Aretha Franklin was no slouch, so she's only going to cover good songs. It is soft rock. Um, I refer to it in my uh, labelling system on my music library as soft rock. Yacht rock doesn't get used because it's, it's just, I think it, it's bigger, it's better than just a uh, look, looking at it as a movement from people that listen to music while they're on an expensive boat. See, Dan, would you would you refer to music as shoegaze or post rock though? Because both of those are d- originally derogatory terms. That's that's very true. Um, I do use both of those terms. Um, however, I think that yacht rock is a newer thing, and it hasn't because it was originally something else, and now is renowned as yacht rock. Um, it's it's almost like an after the fact application of that term as opposed to this is what it was when it was growing up but now it's earned its respect and is referred to by those terms and they ha- and they've they've gained the respect of the of the followers also, I don't think there's any new yacht rock being made it's sort yeah. of a sense, which isn't great yeah and also yeah. when when I uh, going back to what Tom said about shoegaze and post rock they were derogatory originally but the bands that were called shoegaze or post rock, just just totally owned the genre anyway. And they were like, well, yeah, it is shoegaze, it is post rock, and kind of say it, it gained the dignity. But like you said, Dan, like, you know, yacht rock is a new term for a genre. Mm. I, I, I don't like genres anyway, especially these days. They kind of, everything's blended, but. It is, it is. Uh, it yeah, it's not where shoegaze and post rock goes back, you know. Labeling is a, is a bad idea, however, it's a necessity for someone like me who has a large music collection who sometimes fancies bunching some songs together that's what it's there for and that's what originally genres were for genres were an invention of the record labels so that they knew which section of a shop um, to put the records in so that when people went in the doors to the record shop they knew which way to turn to get certain types of records and that's all that's the only reason we have genres so in in high fidelity the film which genre would they have would have Jack Black put the beta band? <laughs> that's a that's a proper asshole question. Man. <laughs> that's the most hipster thing I've said all year. I think. <laughs> yeah, it really is. What did Jack Black write him? Oh, didn't he not refer to it as soppy sentimental shit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, was it? No, it's the beat. Everyone loved the beat band. They were all in the shop. And John Cusack goes, Watch me sell three. He said, Yeah, pop it on and I'll sell seven copies of it or whatever. Yes. But I'm pretty sure Jack Black's character, I can't remember what his name is now in the film, but he was not a fan of that type of music. That's quite possible. It's a long time since I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I remember all, my favourite scene in that is he comes in and there. It, the one guy's been completely dumped and the other guy's like just terminally miserable all the time. He comes in late for a shift on Monday with his Monday morning tape and sticks on Katrina and the wave straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My favourite scene in that film is at the very beginning when he's hanging out the window, um, shouting at the woman he's just left him because he's... Oh, and he's playing 13th Floor Elevators, You're Gonna Miss Me. It's so cool. It's such a good song. The best song on that soundtrack is the last song they play, they play of the credits, which is, um, I believe, when I fall... I believe when I fall in love. Yeah, yeah. From Talking Book, which is one of the greatest albums ever, so I was always going to fall in love with that song. But yeah, that's that's an incredible uh, end of uh, end of movie piece of uh, piece of music for the credits. Another sideline, I think it's probably Jack Black's best film, and he only seems to be good in films where he's a side character and never as a main. Agreed with that. I would also agree. Yeah, I'm with you. So unfortunately, we were denied again with that choice there. So far, only Pete sits on the winner's bench. 
and uh, hopefully we can find another song that will join in there. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go over to uh, Martin and you can talk us through your choice for the evening. Right, okay, so like everyone else, I had many different choices. Well, I didn't actually. When I was posed the question over the group chat uh, by Dan, immediately the first song that popped into my head is my choice. It just came to me. I don't know why. Well, I do know why, actually, and I'll explain, but it just was there. But there were lots that I would um, I would have chosen. I was going to do the whole, you know, kind of semi-alternative thing, you know, like uh, Pete mentioned to me a moment ago, um, Beastie Boys Sabotage, that's an obvious one. Um, Manic Street Preachers, Designed for Life. Um, things like Oasis, Rock and Roll Star, you know, like kind of just obvious songs. Uh, Love Will Tear Us Apart, Heroes by David Bowie. Um, just real, like, kind of, yeah, if, if, if I died in a horrific road traffic accident, what would people play at my funeral sort of song? Right. So, um... <laughs> 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 road rage, catatonia. <laughs> so is this only spe- only specifically in a road traffic accident? Yeah, that's that's how I'm going to go out, man. I know it. I've, I've seen my future. It's going to be a horrific road. I like driving in my car. <laughs> <laughs> no, Gary Newman. You see, there's another one. Gary Newman cars. You know, I, I could have chose that, but you know, I, I have. A... <laughs> All right, go on, got a new motor. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. King Demon by Michael Jackson. <laughs> We could go on all night, couldn't we? <laughs> Songs about car crashes, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the one I've gone for um, is one everybody knows, not just everyone on the panel, but probably everybody that listens to music on the radio, you know, even people that are not into music. Uh, yeah. Pure Shores by All Saints, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> this isn't a joke, right? <laughs> yeah, I know I've probably lost a lot of the points here, but... <laughs> I'm going to tell you why I regain those hipster points in a moment, but I want to talk about the song itself first. It is a standard pop song by a pop band who are just kind of kind of throw away. You know, they were part of that whole girl group thing back when the Spice Girls came out. Um, I thought the All Saints had a lot more credibility um, myself because they just presented better. I think they presented better as strong women and all the rest of it. Um but this particular song, the lyrics mean absolutely nothing to me. I don't listen to them. Um, the singing is great. The vocals are brilliant. They're, you know, they're really well produced. Um, but it's more about the actual backing track. Now, it's by a guy called William Orbit, who I'm a massive, massive fan of. Yeah. He, he was. Um, he had a hit back in the 80s, maybe early 90s, with bass o oh, What was it called? Dave might know this. Um, um, Chime? Fascinating Rhythm. It was top. Yeah, yeah. It was it was huge on the radio at the time when it came out. It was part of that kind of um, the more mainstream aspect of the house stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, and that was fantastic. And ever since I've loved William Orbit, he is a master, an absolute master of production, and he's worked with huge artists. He had worked with Madonna on a Ray of Light album. Yeah. Which is best cracker. It is her best album, and it's an album I love. He. Uh, there's a certain chord progression that he uses. Um, and it's not, again, this song avoids the four chords of doom thing that we hear all the time now. And it's got a beautiful chord progression. William Orbit uses it a lot. And it's one that I favor a lot. Um, Tom, I'm really sorry about this, but I couldn't tell you, you know, technically what the actual, <laughs> you know, melodic construction of it is, but uh, I know it by ear. Um, so this chord progression is great. And if you listen to a song on the Ray of Light album called Substitute, which, again, is William Orbit produced, it's exactly the same chord progression, and it's a very, very similar sound, but both very different songs. Didn't William Orbit do all the stuff with Beth Orton as well? He did, yes. Uh, he yeah. did an album, because he was actually her partner for a while. Uh, yeah. and he did an album called Super Pinky Mandy, which is really rare to find. I have it, um, and it is fantastic. And there's a song called... Um, she cries your name on it yes that's beautiful that's the one i know so there's a there's the william orbit version and then the beth orton version which i think is better mm-hmm. um on her trailer park album and yeah it's got that real southern american desert kind of thing going on with the violins and all. i wonder if he's got his name which is quite clearly a state name for the same reason orbital called orbital because of what i mentioned last time of the illegal raves going around the m25 
I, I have no idea whether it's a stage name or not. It could very well be his real name. I honestly don't know. But Orbit would be a pretty weird last name to have, I think, wouldn't it? So, yeah, I hope that's something I'll have to look up. Um, but his, yeah, this chord progression is lovely. And, you know, I use it a lot in my writing. Um, so that, that makes it stand out for a start. Um, also, it's just the, 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 the synth production is so lush, so beautiful. There's no wonder it was used for the soundtrack to the beach because it matches that whole coast thing totally. The synth pads are the most lush, rich synth pads I've heard in my life. Yeah, I agree. He uses them a lot. He uses, he, mm -hmm. I, I, in logic, you know, I'm never going to recreate them perfectly, but I keep trying to kind of find a... Uh, approximation because i love them so much those synth pads really stand out that kind of like washy sort of um sort of flanging in and out of phase uh is just absolutely wonderful and it does literally evoke being at the beach it really does it evokes yeah. the whole the waves coming in and going out and the sun's beating down and everything um i mean i i do listen to a lot of william orbit and all of his stuff sounds like that all of his stuff sounds that lush and tropical and gorgeous. But I think the most important aspect of why I love this song is because All Saints were hot as, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the punchline when he started mentioning strong women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think with, um, with All Saints, um, just going back... I remember having uh, All Saints' first album actually, which was which was excellent. Um, there were some great songs on there. So the, the, was it their first single? Was Never Ever, mm. I think. Um, which, yeah. which, which was which was a good song. Um, there was the Lady Marmalade um, cover, which which I thought was excellent compared to certain other covers that yeah. I've heard. Um, and the end of the bridge one as well. They did, wasn't it? What, were they <laughs> yeah, they covered Red Hot Chili Peppers, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, uh, there was a song on that album called Beg, Heaven, which were all great, um, great songs. And um, yeah, I did, I'd, I've only kind of been reminded there about um, William Orbit because I, 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 I did know that, that connection. But I think what you say about the track is, um, is, is very, very true. But um, I think like deserving a bit of a mention there as well is um, Shazney Lewis, um, who's a great songwriter and composer. Uh, winner of an Ivan Novello award, actually, for songwriting. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, so, That's cool. so she's written some excellent stuff. Is, uh, in, you know, massively, massively talented. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great choice. Great song. So the, this could potentially join the winner's circle. Uh, I, I'd be keen to hear from Tom though, because he did, did initially. <laughs> no, it's it it doesn't move me. So. William Orbit, I really, so I really loved. He did a load of stuff, uh, re, redoing classical music with the synth pads, yeah. and I loved all of that. So his versions of uh, was Eric Satie's Gymnopody, uh, Nossians, I think. No, Gymnopodies, um, and um, well, it was a lot of Satie because I think he did the Ojibs as well, um, and then his uh, Barber's Adagio for strings is is great. Yeah. My problem with this song is it doesn't it doesn't hit me. It's it's good for you, Tom. Pardon? It's too happy for you. It, it is too happy for me. I need some melancholy, man. It's not end of the world apocalyptica. No, it isn't. It isn't. That's the problem with it. I think for me, it, it doesn't. I like music that takes me somewhere through the course of a track. I mean, but then most of the music I listen to, the tracks are half an hour long, so it's quite easy to move somebody a long way in half an hour. It's a bit, it's a bit harder, a bit harder in a three-minute song, but it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. I'm afraid. Sorry, Martin. Right, I'm banning Tom because <laughs> he only listens to miserable music. We may, in fact, have a different lineup next week, as uh, the, the repercussions of this podcast may well be felt. But we still got still got one more track, as that one seems to have uh, as have also fallen by the wayside. Hang on a second, am I the only one who didn't want that song in, or is someone else going to dispute it as well? I also didn't want it. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so disappointing. You're just lying to yourselves. You're living in denial, guys. <laughs> just one, one final thing on uh, on All Saints. Um, there's an excellent Neptune's remix to Black Coffee, 
which is uh, definitely worth listening to. I need to listen to that because I like Black Coffee as well. It's yeah. a wonderful yeah. chorus. Yeah, I like Black Great Coffee. Course. Neptune's in, aren't really the massive remixes, but, um, but it's a real, like, put the Neptune's twist on it. It's an excellent song. It's really good. Well, I'll certainly check that out. And so unfortunately, yeah, uh, the All, All Saints do not, uh, they get uh, only three votes, because I would have gone for that. I do like that song. I think it's a great song. We do have one more song to discuss for the evening, then, uh, and that's my, uh, my entry for tonight's uh, conversation. I thought there's quite a lot of these. Uh, when we came up with the idea to do this, uh, I, I thought I must have gone through about 50 to 100 tracks that I've, I've played on a playlist as well to decide which I think is going to be the most the most apt for this conversation. I don't know if I've got there. It'd be interesting to see if I can uh, if I can uh, equal Pearl Jam in its success before the panel tonight. Um, but we'll see. There were a lot of songs that I've uh, that I've already mentioned that I uh, I would have gone for. There's absolutely no losers this evening. Um, I certainly like all of those songs, and I would implore anyone who's not familiar with um, with any of the songs that we've mentioned this evening to go out and, and listen to them because I think they're all good um, in their own merit. Uh, being a Prince fan, and a lot of people will expect me to talk about Prince. The song I'm picking tonight is not a Prince song. Um, so those of you who are drinking every time I mention Prince may be a little disappointed. A little sober. But I'm going to talk about Prince slightly because I would have, I was going to put forward uh, When Doves Cry because I think it's um, one of the most important pop singles ever made, um, especially considering that it doesn't have a bass line, which is absolutely insane. Um, but I, I know that Tom has a little bit of a, a, a thing with Prince's um, percussion output in the 80s. So I'm not quite sure the lindrum, the lindrum any song with that effect on it. I, I love it. I'm not sure that would have would have passed. Um, another choice I was going to go for, I was going to go for Lithium by Nirvana. Um, mm. I think that's a very good song. The reason why I wouldn't have gone for uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit would have been, uh, I think it's probably overplayed. And on that album, uh, Lithium and Come As You Are are my favourites. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure um, that it would be good enough as as good as um, even flow by Pearl Jam so I don't I don't know if it quite gets um, gets the, uh, the the nod from everyone um, I was also I, I then became a little bit obsessed with not with trying to beat you all with a cover song um, and I was going to nominate all along the watchtower by Jimi Hendrix because I do think everybody loves that, and it is one of the best covers of all time. Yeah. Not quite my favourite cover of all time, though. Uh, that would go probably to Summer Breeze by the Isley Brothers, um, which is initially uh, done by Seals and Crofts. Um, but that's not my choice again. I think it's... Uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, that kind of that kind of 70s rock would, would go down uh, with the likes of Tom and Pete. I'm not sure what their knowledge bases are on that. Well, I think it comes under the psychedelic soul, doesn't it? Summer Breeze. Hmm. Yeah, psychedelic soul. Yeah, it's a great song. It is a great song. It's an interesting. Uh, it's interesting seeing other people's perspectives. I played Summer Breeze three times this week. <laughs> Literally, oh, uh, three times. This yeah. is the problem with having to go to work every day. <laughs> 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 that would have been my choice otherwise. Uh, but the song I've ultimately gone with, and let me set the scene a little bit. Last week. Do you remember I said that the best Christmas number one of all time was um, was the uh, You're Always On My Mind by the Pet Shop Boys from 1987? It's taken me a week and I've decided that, that I was wrong. Uh, it wasn't the best uh, Christmas number one of all time. The song that I'm picking this evening was the greatest Christmas number one of all time. And I'm going to boldly stake, I think it may be the greatest number one UK single of all time, not just Christmas. That song is from 1981 by a band called The Human League, Don't You Want Me. Very good, Dan, very good. It was the fourth single from their album Dare, which if you've never listened to Dare, please make that a thing. Uh, it is a phenomenal album and it includes other singles like um, Love Action, and that kind of, uh, The Sound of the Crowd. Very, very good album. Um, but I've gone for Don't You Want Me because I think it appeals to everyone. It's it's catchy enough as a pop song. 
uh, everybody knows the chorus, but if you are listening and you haven't heard it, stop right now and go and, go and listen to, to, uh, to some Human League. Uh, Don't You Want Me is one of the catchiest songs ever. It's been used in multiple um, advertising campaigns over the years. Um, but the best thing about it is it's so creepy. It's not a, it's not a love song. It's a, a duet between Phil Oakey and Joanne Catherall where he sets the scene as this kind of, almost like a pimp. He's very jealous and controlling. Uh, and then she provides a rebuttal with the uh, appropriate amount of 80s s independent woman sass where she, yeah, she gets it. And I think so lyrically, the th thematically it's a, it's a great song that speaks about something because this was happening in the 80s. Um, it, people starting to question things about women's roles within relationships. So I think it's an important song um, from that perspective. Um, that he is, he picked her up, he turned her around, he, he, he turned her into someone new. But no, she's not having any of that, she was, she was good before. Um, so it's, 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 about, it's about empowerment. Um, but also, it, it's, just, it's just great. It doesn't sound like it's necessarily as from 1981 as, as other songs from that time would. It hasn't quite got the kind of dated production values. The, the synths are quite low. There's no, there's no really high-pitched reverberating synth on it. It's, it, it's just a great song. I could talk about, I could talk, talk about this song for, for such a long time. Uh, it's one of the first songs I remember as a kid. Getting, it, remember knowing all the words. Everybody knows the first chorus, uh, the first verse and the chorus. Everybody knows that. It's, it's just brilliant. Everybody knows it. It's creepy, it's catchy, it's got fantastic production. Everybody sings along with Philip, uh, Philip Oakey's parts. Um, all the women sing along with the Joe and Catherall parts. It, uh, it, it was an important moment for the band because, I mean, they just had Martin Ware leave and form Heaven 17 and they, people weren't sure what they were going to do in the 80s. And then they come out with this, which Philip Oakey himself didn't want to release as a single. He thought it was just a throwaway track. And it suddenly becomes one of the biggest selling songs of all time. It's from, from 1981. It set the scene for the 80s. It's danceable. It's singable. You, uh, yeah, it's just an absolutely phenomenal song. Do you know what? In the words of Louis Walsh, who he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is fantastic. I mean, I have Dare on vinyl. It's Human League are, um, they're, they're, you know, they're not one of my favourite bands, but they are a favourite band of a lot of my favourite bands. So, um, for instance, like Trent Reznor, you know, he's he's all over um, Human League, he's totally, totally, all over the, the first Nine Inch Nails album, and it is all about for me the um, <laughs> the sound of the band. You know, they were, uh, you know, they were synth based. There was no live instruments and they sounded fantastic for it but like you said dan i think the whole um the whole uh socio-sexual relationship kind mm. of aspect to it was really important especially at that time because even now we're struggling with it even now you know absolutely, whole... absolutely. it's a song essentially it's about almost domestic abuse an abuser in a relationship trying to be controlling and she her retort to that is is important Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's not something that's addressed as much in music as I would like it to be, because it's a very difficult subject to write about. Um, and to write about it in a dignified way and write about it in an honest way is very difficult. I Like last week, I was talking about the Afghan Whigs and about the, you know, the protagonist of their music being someone who, who obviously knows they're a, a, probably a toxic male in a relationship. It, it takes a lot of honesty to get that out in your music and it doesn't happen enough. There's too much of, uh, you know, love songs being about you, you fall in love and everything's perfect. But I think also that there's, you know, the whole female music movement now is, is huge and it's getting bigger and as it should, you, we are, we are getting closer to an equality and equity between males and females in music. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we've ever been at a stage where we can enjoy female music as much as we ever have in the past. Yeah, absolutely. This the whole mm -hmm. idea of toxic relationships doesn't come up enough. Mm -hmm. um, there's an album that I've been listening to a lot by Sharon Van Etten. Uh, she was an actress in the AO series on Netflix or whatever. But um, she uh, she was in a toxic relationship, you know, heavily abusive relationship and wrote an album about it came out of it 
And her most recent album is about how she's met someone new who understands her position and she's feeling like kind of both reborn but also really nervous because obviously she's went through this really bad time with a previous partner and she's just trying to get this new partner to understand. Um, and I think that whole idea of toxic relationships and, you know, um, how the whole, you know, male-female divide in pop music, you know, not, not alternative music, it's all there. PJ Harvey, you know, for instance, is, you know, the, the feminism movement in alternative rock has been there for a long time. But in pop music, the stuff that you put on, you know, the, the FM radio show and your daytime radio and hear about really abusive relationships and about how women are dealing with it. Also men, men go through it too. Um, I think it's really important. And that song, as you say, it, it kind of sets a benchmark. Unfortunately, like you also said, not a lot of people know what it's really about. Yeah. You know, they think it's this romantic story about I saw you in a cocktail bar and we got, you know, got together. And... But that means you can appreciate it on two levels. Because Absolutely. you've got the, the superficial, everybody sings along with the chorus and recognises it. But if you listen to it, it's good on a second level. It's, if you go in and examine it on a, on a um, more scrutinous level, You'll be surprised how many people misinterpret lyrics for everything. As a like, wedding DJ of many years, the amount of people that ask for Band of Gold as their first dance, and it's like, yeah. you understand Band of Gold is about divorce, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mar Martin, do you think that it's, you said that um, songs that sort of tackle this subject matter, do you think it's a case that those songs, uh, there's not that many of them out there, or do you think it's that people possibly aren't identifying the subject matter and aren't talking about it enough? Um, I think it's a bit of both. I think that, um, like I said, I think there's quite a lot of... It's discussed a lot in alternative music. Even Pearl Jam, there are mm. songs like Better Man is about an abusive relationship. Um, so is Alive. If you know what Alive is about, then it's actually quite horrific and quite terrible. Um, but I think that, like, you know, people misinterpret their lyrics in that in that regard. But also that... A lot of those people that are writing those songs are really creative and really strong and kind of really have a lot of insight into their own lives and stuff, so they're able to express it musically. Whereas with pop music, because a lot of it is kind of very much manufactured and um, it's usually written by men, to be honest with you. You know, if you listen to a lot of the songs that are sang on X Factor or your mainstream radio songs, most of them are written by men, sung by females, which in itself is like, to me, kind of... You know, I'm a bit elitist in it. I like music written by the artist that performs it more than, you know, music that's written by someone else. But, yeah, I, I, it, it's a difficult one. I, I, I just think it's a difficult subject matter, and I think people don't want to be confronted with it. Um, that's why it's only now, only recently, that things like uh, your soaps are dealing with toxic relationships. There's been this massive storyline in EastEnders recently People don't want to see it. People are in denial. Either people who aren't in that situation don't want to believe it goes on, or people who are in that situation situation don't want to be reminded of it. Yeah, don't want to be reminded of it. You know, and it's it, it's 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 quite horrible, really. Um, I think in in the modern era we have the Me Too movement, and I, uh, that's that's kind of brought to light a lot of these things that people haven't wanted to address for such a long time. So I think it's. It's important that we do, uh, because they do happen, and it's uh, absolutely it's tragic that so, so statistically so many people have to suffer in silence. But if you look at, if you look, take it back a step, there aren't, there aren't that many moments where you can say, ah, progress was made here, I think. But if you look at Don't You Want Me Baby, like, whilst it's not renowned in the mainstream as being a moment where it's touched upon. If you go back and listen to it, Phil Oakey was 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 saying something important there, definitely. And it's 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 caused uh, it's a catalyst for a lot of other conversations that we're having now. Um so yeah that I think it's a great song but it's an important song. It is an important song, I agree with you. It's also important sonically. I mean, it's just it's just a beautiful song to listen to. It's just so... When you think about how... I, I watched a documentary about um, synthesizer music on BBC. There's a documentary about it. It's very good. Um, yeah. And about how little equipment they had back then. You know, we've got more on our laptop now than they did in a whole recording. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's incredible the amount of sonic texture that a band like that 
were able to get out. And there were so many of those bands as well, you know, that were able to do that. Tom, you're very quiet. Oh no, I I I really I I really like I actually really like this song. I think um yeah, you can have this one. Um it's it's not a genre that I normally go for. I think it was very interesting hearing Martin talk about um the portrayal of of toxic relationships in music because so in the early 2000s I was very into the whole sort of alt country movement and it was it was very big in the music there i mean you listen to the lyrics in like rilo kiley there's some really some really important stuff being said in some of those songs although she tells it as a story it's not quite got quite so it's not got the pain of of some of the other stuff out there that um that martin mentioned but no i i i like this song i think it's it it's definitely yes lyrically it's lyrically it's it's covering very important subject matter but fundamentally if this came on and you were in a nightclub you'd probably enjoy it yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the beauty yeah. of the song though that's yeah the beauty of the song because it is just you could write a you know an angry guitar song about being in a toxic relationship also just double check everybody's heard it and knows what it is i don't know, i've never heard it in my life <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Great song. Great song. Definitely thumbs up. Dave, thumbs up from you? Well, um, yes, I've heard it, and yes, I like the song. As far as would I choose it off of the Dare album as my favourite? Probably not, but I understand why you've chosen it, and you've argued your point very well. Just to, just to clarify on your point now, it's not my favourite song on Dare. It's not my favourite song. But I went for a song that I thought everyone it, it would at least be in everyone's top three on Dare. Yeah. I think this, this is where I'm struggling with this promise of this episode because I it's so ingrained for me to not pick the obvious track from an album because of what I've been doing as a DJ. Yeah. I can't really... I'm always crap when people say, name your favourite track or what's your favourite track off this? What's your favourite track off that? It's like, well, my particular favourite track is this because I will look at something know what a crowd wants to hear and I don't want to play it or go one neck one below. <laughs> yeah. I think we can all agree on that though. I think it, 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 yeah. all, all five of us, you know, I think mm-hmm. we um, we all have that similar outlook is that, you know, when we have an album, like with Even Flow, for instance, it's definitely not my favourite album song on the album. No. Um, but like, we all do that. We have an album which has got a standout single, Smells Like Teen Spirit. It's probably the worst song on the album. And in fact, I skip it because I don't like that song. But the rest of the album's yeah. cool. I think that's the mark of someone that really appreciates music, really appreciates it and looks into it in a way that maybe a mainstream audience doesn't. Just unfortunate that's in a juxtaposition with greatest ever arguments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard because it's... Yeah, I mean, going through my the albums that I love, I mean, the tracks that I would pick are not are probably not the singles. But is that because do I love the question I always have to ask myself is do I love them because when I listen back to them it feels more new, or do I love them because they're better songs? Yeah. And that's you have to remember what you felt when you first heard it. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. because also you've got the overplay effect. Oh, yeah. Bohemian Like You came out off 13 Tales. Yeah. It's an amazing song, it really is, but it got overplayed so much, it became my least favourite song on the album because it was overplayed, not because yeah. it was the worst song on the album. No, no, it's, it's a very strong song, but yeah, it suffers from the overplay massively. Evening. We have Even Flow by Pearl Jam and we have Don't You Want Me by the Human League. Uh, both certified banger. You heard it here first. But which one's the best? Who wants to decide first? I'll go first if you like. Go for it, Tom. Because um because I'm probably gonna surprise you here and um, now my thought process behind this was and the reason why I chose 
Blue Monday as well is because when we talk when you talk about bangers, I still think of that sort of late nineties definition of something you put on uh, when you're at, when you're in a, a nightclub or something like that, and you get the floor going. And although I love Even Flow, it's not my favourite Pearl Jam song, and it's not music to dance to. Um, so although it's a brilliant song, it's not a banger. So I'm going with Don't You Want Me. Tom, we used to be mates. <laughs> so I take it mine. That means you would pick Even Flow then. Well, yeah, I would. Um, I, I totally because only it's a bit. I'm a bit too biased with this because Pearl Jam are probably the most important band in my life, and that ten album was an album I listened to over and over again in my early in my in my teens, my angsty days, and going through all that thing and. Um, anything with even flow just like don't you want me is just the overplay aspect i've heard them way too many times that um i really have to concentrate on them to when i listen to them, i can't just listen to them and they take me by surprise anymore um because i know every part and it's just where i go right you know it, it's in sequence on the album i know it's coming up i know exactly what it's going to sound like but i have to concentrate on it which is a good thing actually because I'm finding myself doing that a lot more nowadays where I'll listen to music that I know really, really well. And instead of just listening to it and going, this is really cool. Like, uh, you know, like sabotage for instance, you know, it never loses its fire for me, but um, I actually have to like really focus on the music and listen to the parts and listen to what's going on. It is even flow, but only because it's, it's such an important song in my musical history and my life history. And Eddie Vedder's voice, you know, as soon as he starts singing, I'm melting. Dave? Uh, my choice would be kind of the same, to be dreadfully honest. This was a choice between Human League and Pearl Jam. I'm probably going to go with Pearl Jam only because of the song choice. Um, if I was here both in isolation or if we were in a pub or a club, I'm going to be loving the even flow ahead of Human League. Um and as Martin said, yeah, Eddie Bella's voice is incredible. And I love the drumming on that track, and I love the syncopation and the melody. So that's going to be touching me more than Human League would. Pete, have you got anything more to add to the conversation in terms of, I mean, we've discussed Eden Flow, but in terms of now that you know that Human League has come up, would you say that that's a bigger banger, or are you sticking with Eden Flow? Um, well, it has made me think about it. Um... I mean, obviously, they're both great, great songs. Um, I think it's quite interesting what Tom said about the the interpretation of, like, if it came on in a club, you know, obviously, you, you depending on what you've gone out to listen to it. Um, I, I think that the, the difference between the two that I would make is I would, I would seek out even flow to listen to, and I probably wouldn't seek out um, Don't You Want Me to actually listen to in my in, in my own time. I'd love it if it came on. I think it's a great, great tune. But I that would be the only difference I'd really make between them is I, I would I would put on even flow and I, I don't think I've ever actually played myself. Um you don't you want me. So Fair enough. I, I'm I'm torn. I, I don't know. <laughs> don't you want me is a song that, that I I've, I've put forth for this conversation um, because I love it. But I also do love even flow and then I think it is ultimately down to what mood you're in. I think that's the kind of way the conversation goes, isn't it? If if Don't You Want Me comes on and you're in a club, it's more danceable. You sing along with it. It's a you, it's a kind of it's almost like a, a participation song. It's put before you and you join in, and that's what makes it such an enjoyable experience. Whereas Even Flow is just about the energy. Um, and the the raw kind of sounding melody to it, you can sing along with it because, as I said, it is a, it's such a melodic track. But it, I'm going to stick ultimately with "Don't You Want Me" be, simply on the basis that, as a singer myself, I can sing along to uh, to "Don't You Want Me" and know all the words, and it suits my voice. Whereas even flow, I really have to strain myself to get those any better sounds out of my mouth it's not really something that i can i i tend to participate with uh i listen to songs largely um to 
um, as, as something that I can interact with, either as something that's really good to dance to, or something that's good to sing along, or or um, or something that I could potentially see myself singing. That's how I identify with songs. Um, and even flow, as much as I love it, I can never see myself doing a, a cover version of it or putting myself into that track uh, to have that that absolute joy of interacting with that song. It's a, it's more of a passive a listening experience for me where it's a bit more uh, introspective in the way I, I connect with that song. It, it means a lot. Pearl Jam do mean a lot to me, which I'm sure might, might not be uh, chuffed to hear that he's... Uh, that I'm in, I'm into Palm Jam. Palm Jam, um, brother, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, yeah, it, it's something that I I don't actively participate in my listening experiences with uh, with Pearl Jam and with other grunge bands. It tends to be my the, the rock songs I tend to listen to from an uh, admiration level, whereas something that's new wave like uh, Don't You Want Me is something that I can really dance to, can see myself messing around with it, maybe covering it, doing bits and pieces. And I just love all the elements of the song that combine into uh, how I see how it's performed. Whereas even flow for me feels a bit more alien, a bit more a bit more different to what uh, what I would normally listen to. So I'm, I'm gonna go with Don't You Want Me just out of familiarity and what it means to me personally. Um, so that does mean that does mean that our winner this evening is Pete. Yeah, even flow all the way. Even flow is the one. So we have certified that as a banger. Uh, even flow is uh, is our winner of this evening. Uh, but th don't get me wrong, there are a lot of songs that we've mentioned tonight that are on a par with that song, uh, just as good, if if maybe if not better. But it just happens to be that. The planets aligned this evening, and the, uh, the our personal tastes mean that that's the one song that we can all listen to. It'd be interesting to to come back to this, maybe in sort of six months' time or a year, um, with the same question, um, because I think through this podcast, I certainly myself I will be listening to all the recommendations that come out of it, and I hope that people listening at home are doing the, uh, will, will consider doing the same. So it'd be interesting to come back to this at a later time when uh, when we know a bit more about everyone's tastes and uh, and other songs that we've listened to over the, over the months and maybe revisit it at a later stage and see if we can come up with some others and so stand by for uh, potentially part two coming in the future. Uh, but for now, even flow is the one. Of course, it is. So what's going on? Um, what's going on in the next couple of weeks? Then we will be recording another episode uh, in in the coming weeks. But what's everyone going to be? Uh, what's everyone going to be taking away? What's everyone going to be listening to in the in the coming weeks? Anyone got any plans to listen to anything in particular that's due out? Maybe some new uh, new releases that, that we can uh, we can get people's um, attention turned towards. I do know what I will be listening to. Um, probably on repeat for about the next 10 days or so is Pure Shores by All Saints which <laughs> one of the biggest bangers of all time mm. <laughs> it's yeah. good of one mm. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm well, just looking forward to mm. making music again yeah. with you guys have you got any ideas to make any music Maybe what are you um, what, what are you thinking uh, I've got ideas coming out of my head like oh man um, obviously there's some projects that we need to finish and uh pete's got a project on the go which i want to contribute to um uh, but i also have my own ideas um yeah i am kind of going down the nine inch nails route of doing that kind of thing um i just love the whole mixture of um sort of uh alternative rock guitar but with synth stuff as well so i'm probably going to be i've got some ideas that i want to work on but it is i kind of i'm uh, kind of like i i I hero worship Trent Reznor a bit too much. I think it's going to be one of those things where people are he's trying to make a Nine Inch Nails song there. Um, but hopefully, you know, I'll come up with some good stuff. I'll help you out, Martin. <laughs> I'm going to need some dirty bass. Yeah. bass. Oh, I've got my I got myself a Waldorf Blofeld now synth rack. So uh, I can do some do some synth stuff now. Oh nice. Have you got any projects you're working on at the moment, Tom? Um so <laughs> Sort of on and off. So I've I've been carrying on doing a lot of um, minimalist classical stuff um, and quite looking forward to 
so I need to start doing some more composition and scoring stuff. Speaking of stuff that's coming out soon, I know Matt, it, Max Richter has another uh, has an album coming out in the next couple of weeks. He's a minimalist classic compo- classical composer, very much in the. He's he's very interesting because he's he feel like the music feels a lot like Einaudi. But on the other hand, it's also he's got some really interesting electronic elements and stuff like that. So that'll be worth checking out. Um, also in August, I am a glutton for punishment, so I have pre-ordered it, even though I know that it won't be up to their early albums, but I'm still doing it anyway. But I know Biffy have a new album out coming in August. Um, and even though I hated their last one, um, and I'll probably not like this one either, but I've still pre-ordered it because... I've got to give it the benefit of the doubt. You know what, Tom? Do you know yeah. what I respect about you, man? Yeah. And it's something that I like. I kind of have the same thing. It's a loyalty to a band where even when they're disappointing, you still go, I am still going to follow this band. I'm going to buy their yeah. records. Oh, loyalty is important. I mean, Prince has been dead for four years and I'm still listening to the albums that he's releasing. Uh, which leads me on to uh, Sign of the Times, which is coming out in September. The, uh, it's an incredible nine-disc remaster, super deluxe remaster of Sign of the Times, which I already think is probably the best album ever made. Uh, but now they've got 60-odd six, um a vault tracks, uh, a concert, and um, a DVD which features Miles Davis on horns. So that's that's going to be something that I'm looking forward to. But that's not for three months. In the in the coming in the coming weeks, one thing that I really 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 keen to get into is um, uh, Run DMC. Uh, Pete's recommended me uh, a couple of their albums um, recently. And I am aware that it's a gap in my hip hop knowledge. I've never really been. It's Matt. quite a big gap, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm aware of I'm aware of the singles and and the big songs and like the remixes with Jason Evans in the '90s, that kind of thing. Everything that's ubiquitous about Run DMC is something that I'm familiar with. But I've never listened. I've got Raising Hell, but I've never listened to it the whole way through. Uh, that's the kind of thing I want to get into. Their album cuts and uh, my Adidas and Peter Piper. You need to have a listen to. Dan, you need to get, you need to get Pete. Uh, Pete will probably back me up on this. The Tougher Than Leather album is incredible. So good. It was one of the first uh, times where rock and rap kind of got together. Um, everyone says that the first time it happened was, you know, Walk This Way. But uh, the Tougher Than Leather album, there's so many cool guitar riffs on it that are sampled so brilliantly. It's just, yeah, it's such a great album. Yeah, absolutely great album. I mean, obviously a very, like, a very seminal um, group. Um, actually, the, the album that I actually recommended that Dan um, l- listened to was um, the, the, the the album that they did later on, which was called Crown Royal. Yes, um, yes, classic. Which which was a uh, which is an absolutely great album. I don't think it got particularly great reviews, um, but it had it had a lot of um, featured artists on it, etc. But um, but I, I thought it was excellent. It's definitely worth a listen because um, they were still good um, even then. Um, and it's also an album where DMC doesn't actually rap at all. He's in all of the uh, the photography and marketing for it, but he refused to to rap on it. Uh, I can't remember what the reason was. So it's all rapped by um, by uh, the Reverend Run on mm-hmm. that one. Definitely an artist I need to get into more. Influential MCs, man. I mean, like the first Beastie Boys album, it's, it could be in Run DMC album. But then it's produced by the same people, so... Well, there's a... I can't remember which track it was now, but there is a, there is a Beastie Boys track. I, I keep thinking it may be Slow and Low, but I don't think it is that. But there's a... Uh, or maybe Slow and Low that was originally meant for for Run the MC, I think, but became a Beastie Boys song in the end. There was a lot of that. Man, we, we should actually do a whole episode about the Beastie Boys. I think, we can, uh, I think we can look at that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the plan is to do episodes on individual artists. So if you are um, keen for our thoughts on a particular subject, please do contact us on social media. You can find us now where you can find all your podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud. Um, We've also got a blog that we'll be launching very soon where we will be doing not just uh, what you hear now, but there will be articles and reviews. Um, I certainly am going to commit to, to writing some reviews um, on that website so we will be uh, sharing that with you very shortly where you can read our opinions and things that don't necessarily make it to the podcast we're going to make this uh, a bit more of a multimedia experience uh, that's the plan anyway um, 
Anyway, Dave, Dave uh, what, what, what are you looking forward to that's coming out in music or uh, coming up soon? Uh, there's no new releases I've got on the horizon, but I've just... I'm in the process of moving house. I've just got all of my vinyl from my house and all of my vinyl from my old record shop uh, moved into here. So I've got absolutely masses of stuff. I'm going to do a couple of mixes, I think, as soon as I get some free time to myself. One of which will be a Yacht Rock mix. I look forward to that. Who are you going for? So are you a Tom guy, you're a Martin guy, you're a Dave guy? I'm Who, a Pete guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just because of Tom, like, not appreciating Pure Shores. I, I wasn't, right, <laughs> but now I'm a Pete guy. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Oh, one thing I did want to bring up, just because uh, in case you guys hadn't seen in the news, um, the Theatre Royal in Plymouth is in some pretty dire straits at the moment, um, and the arts in general. There are, um, I would strongly, I would just request anybody out there listening, look into local arts-based charities and give them some money at the moment because these people haven't earned it. They're mostly self-employed. Uh, they they won't have received any pay for, for months. And if we don't start paying for this stuff, we're going to lose it. Um, and I think that would be a travesty. So, um, yeah, I think please, please can people use this opportunity to look into your, your local arts and creative scenes and, and try and try and keep those alive. Yeah, I would absolutely echo that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they're just like soft open in their cafes or buying some merchandise or anything you can do is great. Yeah. It's a good point because I think that with all this situation going on at the moment and everybody's talking about key workers and everything, which is right, um, I think uh, people are forgetting about how important art is and how people are now, especially this weekend, the Glastonbury weekend, people are realising that actually how important it is just to be able to go to a live gig, you know, or whatever. It's just pe people are kind of, uh, what's the word, they're like undervaluing art as such yeah. and we can't yeah. do that we cannot do that we can't let art it's bad enough as is yeah and yeah. art it's the one thing that unites people and the one thing that gets people through the tough times that we're going through yeah mm. the, the cacophony sessions is very much a conversation about music that's ongoing and we want as much interaction as possible so if there's anybody out there who has uh, any uh, anything that they want to share in terms of their art um, then we are looking for we're looking for pieces of music that we can play um, just surrounding the, the, the episode itself. Um, not necessarily going to discuss your pieces of music. So if you send, send us a piece of music, it's not good. Don't worry, we're not, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to scrutinize it. It's just going to, we're just going to, we're open for, uh, for collaborations and, uh, and let's promote some, some music through this as well. Because ultimately that's what this is all about. We want to promote music. We want to discuss music. We want to, bring songs that have been under years of, uh, of darkness and not been not been discussed we want to we want to bring them to the forefront of people's minds whether it's a song by someone as famous as uh, as Pearl Jam or whether it's some some local act who want who wants some exposure we'll work with anyone so um, yeah if anybody has any anything that they want us to discuss or even just share yeah get in touch where this is this is a music podcast all about music we love talking about music we love it to death so please get involved and uh, share with us anything that you think is uh, worthy of discussion or worthy of airing in these in, in these conversations that we're having. Well said, Dan. Yeah. All that remains to be said is thank you very, very much for joining the second episode of the Cacophony Sessions podcast. Uh, we'll be back with more controversial opinions, more uh, arguments and people putting forward songs that nobody else has heard of. But for now, this has been Dan saying goodnight. Sausages. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> Make sure you stay funky and stay tuned for the next episode. Love you, bye. 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 bye.